Welcome back to Neighbor the Sleep Command. I thought I'd do a short video today on some tips and tricks and just interesting points of information that I've picked up from playing through this update for the last couple of days. There's just a few things that have been overlooked in my videos that I've maybe not seen other people talking about or things I want to reinforce so that when you get access to the update this week, you're in a situation where you're well informed and you can know some things that might put you a little bit ahead of the competition or at least give you some food for thought on how you're going to build your ships. So hopefully you're going to stick around. I'll timestamp all of the different things I'm going for. So if there's something that particularly interests you, you can jump ahead to that. Otherwise, this shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes. Let's go through some new interesting things in the update. First things first, Ewar. This is going to really require its own video at some point because Ewar is a major layer in the game and it's something that you need to be really on top of. But the basic basics is that the Alliance have access to the E90 Blanket Jammer. We all know how good the Blanket Jammer is. We all know how frustrating it is to be jammed by the Blanket Jammer. As in a Shelter Alliance player, you have radars available to you that can burn through the jamming and provide you with a target track even when you're being jammed. But as an OSP player, you don't have a reliable way to do that or as many options to do that as a Shelter player. So you need to have other solutions to deal with jamming or other ways to approach the situation to give you the ability to act and, you know, have the right idea when this is happening. One of the ways to get around jamming is to um, coordinate your tracking from different angles. So rather than having your fleet gathered together like a shelter player quite often will, you can spread your fleet out and have radars on other ships. We'll have a look at those radars a little bit later in the video, uh, but that'll at least give you tracks when one of your ship is getting jammed, you can have another ship providing a track to it from another angle. But the other thing you can do is try and punish your opponent for jamming you. One really nice change in this update is when you're getting jammed, you will have a jam indicator appearing on screen in your sensor manager and in a combat view to show you a rough direction the jamming is coming from. Now we all know that the blanket jammer has a range of 10,000 meters. So what you can do if you want, and something I've been trying out, is putting size two missile launchers on my OSP ships, they can take them, and building for myself a um, fixed anti-radiation seeker missile that is set to signal discrimination jamming. This will provide you with a very cheap missile, four points is your average, that will be able to home in and find your enemy. Now we know that this only needs a 10,000 meter range, so you can actually push for more top speed. And here we've got something that's able to hit 380 meters per second with a 10,000 meter range. Um, the only problem with it is it has a programming time of eight seconds. There are ways around that, but this is just a very basic idea I want to give to you to run away with. Don't sleep on jamming intercepting missiles because they are something that will be quite useful for the OSP to use against the shelter. Um, when they're getting mad jammed. And there's probably going to be a little bit of a weird meta swing to start with where people start playing faction versus faction and you'll find that your OSP people will getting jammed a lot. They'll institute um, solutions to the jamming like this. The jamming will go backwards and forwards. Um, a lot of players won't really think to turn their jammers off when these missiles are incoming. They might not even realize that they are jam seeking. Um, and, and that can get you a good a good win or an easy win very quickly if you just overwhelm them with jamming. Obviously, OSP have really good PD, but this could be a way to eke out something extra from the situation in addition to the other things I'm going to go over in the video. Now, I just mentioned PD, and now this is probably an important moment to actually go over PD with you very quickly for the faction. Um, they have three generic PD weapons, uh, which I've lost on my screen here for a second. Here they are. They've got the P11 Pavis PDT, the P20 Bastion PDT, and the P60 Grazer PDT. The most important thing to be aware of for these guns, uh, for these weapons, is that they have an insane rate of fire. If you have multiple Pavis PDTs on your ship, each of them will have a rate of fire of 4,800 rounds per minute. Um, that's double the Defender uh, rate of fire, because it's a double-barreled gun. This means you can't get away with taking something like 5,000 rounds of 20 millimeter ammo. You're going to run out of ammunition very, very quickly with these PD weapons. So think about it very carefully when you're building your ships and make sure you're taking an appropriate amount of ammo for your guns. Consider that I have three on this ship. That is essentially 15,000 rounds per minute of fire that I have um, need, to, need to cover. Just if I want to fire for a minute, I need 15,000 rounds. Um, so that is a lot of ammo to go through and something you really need to be aware of when you're building that. And that carries over to the Bastion as well. The Bastion is a rotary flak cannon. It has a rate of fire of 
a quarter second and the autoloader holds 100 rounds and then reloads in a quarter second. So this is another very fast firing solution for point defense. It's going to eat ammo very, very quickly. Just make sure you're taking an appropriate amount of ammo for it. Don't be caught out and uh, find yourself out of ammo, which is something that's happened to me a lot in my testing games. I've been learning the faction is I've been taking similar amounts of ammo that I take in my shelter fleets and I've been burning through that ammo very, very quickly. Keep that in mind when you're building your ships. Something not to sleep on is the combination of a plasma cannon and 100 millimeter guns. I have two cargo monitors in my current fleet that I am playing with that as primary weapons are mounting one plasma and two T-30s. That's um, eight 100 millimeter cannons backed up by a plasma cannon. These ships are able to rip through frigates and corvettes very, very quickly, and they can threaten larger ships because they have the plasma cannon. Because of the plasma cannon, the HE ammo on the 100 millimeters can penetrate even the biggest ships in the game. Obviously the plasma doesn't strip the armor straight away, but it will do it over time. As an Alliance Shelter player, you need to come into the game considering how you're gonna deal with ships like this. These ships are fast, they're very maneuverable, they have more armor than you think of, the cargo monitor has 40 centimeters of armor, and they can bother you out at a long distance, moving laterally and moving behind cover. Don't get stuck in the mindset that you have Axfords and you have Solomons and these ships are immune to 100 millimeter fire. Those days are over. If you're fighting the OSB and you see that purple trail in the sky, they're gonna start dealing damage to your ships. These are very, very versatile ships that can do a lot of damage throughout the entire battle. What I do with them is I'm running a little bit of grape shot in them. Um, and the grape, what will happen is the 100 millimeter cannons will act as PD if you don't have them set to anything else and they will fire on incoming missile tracks with their grape fire. Then, once you started to do some damage with your plasma, I switched to HEHC, just to show you what that is. The HEHC is a eight centimeter penetrator with 70 component damage. That's double the component damage of a standard HE cell shell. This means that this can do a lot of damage very quickly, and you can attack from surprising angles. Like I was saying before, don't get caught out by these. As an OSP player, consider the fact that the plasma cannon has a 12,000 meter range and your 100 millimeter guns have a 7,000 meter range. You can sit out at 7,000 meters with either a SunDrive Racing Pro Drive or switch out for the Chi 11 yard drive, get you some more lateral movement, more linear thrust, and just circle around the outside of an enemy fleet that's engaging one of your teammates, hit them from behind, get some plasma damage on them, hit them with 100 millimeters, and then when you see them turning to face you, switch your guns out to grape and just move behind some asteroids and keep them out of your line of fire. It's a very scary situation to deal with, and I really want to make sure shelter players are aware of this before they get into fleet building. You have to be able to deal with these situations. You do have some tools for that. One of the biggest new um, additions to the game, if I just quickly jump over here and build an axe for you, is the addition of, that's the wrong size turret, actually that turret's fine, the addition of the Mark 65 cannon. This is a triple barreled 250 millimeter gun. This is a really good solution to small ships like cargo feeders. I haven't investigated building them up, but don't forget that this is in the game now. This could be a way of dealing with them. So think about the new meta. You're no longer going to be going into Solomon versus Solomon jewels. It's always going to be um, your Axfords and your Solomons are going to be up against cargo feeders. They're going to be up against tugboats. They're going to be up against um, freighters as well. You need to change your mindset for how you're building your fleets and think about what you're fighting, not what you're defending against, if that makes sense. Mines are an exciting new addition to the game, and I'm really happy with their inclusion because it gives the OSP a way to trap and think cleverly about how they're moving around the battle space, and also just means that the, the Alliance, Shelter Alliance players need to be very situationally aware of where they're going, and actually confirming that areas are safe before they move ships into them. You're going to have to be moving in with screeners to confirm if there's mines in a location or grouping together to have mass PD so you don't get caught up by mines. That said, um, there's some things to be aware of about mines that are not 100% immediately um, obvious. One, don't put these on points. Don't fly into a point, deploy your mines and fly away. If they're in the open, your enemy will see them from far away and be very easily able to destroy them with PD from a long distance. The mines themselves are ship killers. If I just show you very quickly here, a single mine does 5,000 hit points of damage with 200 centimeter armor penetration. If just one of these gets through and hits an enemy ship, it can completely core it. 
So what you need to do is put these in locations where they're going to surprise your enemy. Lay them behind asteroids near areas your enemies are going to move through. Putting them near points rather than on the point will give you that ambush effect without revealing them and showing them to your enemy. However, two important caveats not to forget about. One, the mines take 90 seconds to arm. If your enemy detects them before that 90 seconds, they're going to wipe them out with no problems at all. The mines aren't going to do anything. So don't push too far forward with your mines. Keep them in a location where they're going to be safe for that arming period. Two, there's no such thing as a friendly mine. Once you have deployed a mine, consider it an active threat to your fleet. Do not fight among or near a minefield that you have set or an ally has set. Never ever consider a mine to be friendly. If your ship loses power or its antenna gets destroyed, it can no longer send and transmit radio messages, the mine will acquire it as a target and kill it. The mines will assume that any ship that is not pinging IFF to them is an enemy threat and your ship's PD will not shoot at an incoming mine because it will assume that it is friendly. Do not put yourself in the situation where you are risking death to your own mines. The temptation is very much to move into a safe location, deploy mines around your ship, and then fight from within that minefield, using them as a deterrent for your enemy to close on you. Don't fall into this trap. I have lost ships in the last week against the AI because I've lost the communication facilities on my ships. Keep your mines safe away from your fleet, but in positions where they can ambush your enemy, and you will be having a great time. Something else I want to really draw your attention to is the versatility of cargo containers. Now, we've already seen the cargo hauler with its massive stacks of cargo containers firing them out in every direction. That's really cool. But every ship from the cargo feeder up can mount a stack launcher. Stack launcher is a small module that can hold two cargo containers on it. And there's actually a lot of very interesting options you can put into these. Um, if we have a look here, um, we've gone over some of these before, but I'm going to go over them all again. The decoy container for line ships is a very interesting one. I have a line ship here, it's set up as a broadsider. What I've got mounted on it are two line ship decoy containers. And the idea behind that is I'm in combat, I'm firing at my enemy, my ship takes a big hit or I'm getting overwhelmed. I move into cover, the enemy lose their, their um, track on me, they no longer have me on radar. And I launch two line ship cargo containers in different vectors away from my ship. From my enemy's perspective, I peek out from behind the asteroid again. The containers will move at the average speed of a line ship. They'll report a radar return of a line ship. And now my enemy is not sure which one of these ships is me. And it gives me a little bit of time to think about what I'm doing. The decoy containers for clippers are also a really great mind game to play with your opponent. They move at the speed of a clipper ship. They move at 40 meters per second. You can send these towards back cap points at any point in the game from anywhere. You can have a cargo feeder that's doing some radar work, fire off a couple of clippers um, from nowhere. Your enemy will suddenly see a clipper moving its speed towards a cap point. Any Alliance Shelter player playing against the OSP will be paranoid about getting back, get back capped. Sorry. Um, the shuttles are fast and they're very good cappers and the capping game is going to be an important part of deciding a lot of big games. So they're going to see these and suddenly your opponent needs to make a decision. And I don't know about you, but one of my philosophies for strategy games is to try and make my opponent make as many decisions as possible because that will introduce decision fatigue onto them and eventually they'll make a mistake. So if I'm firing off a bunch of clippers, just they're fire and forget, basically four points, distract your enemy, fire a clipper off at like three different control points, make them think you're going to go mine those points, make them think you're going to go cap those points. If they commit a ship or commit some missiles to that clipper, Fantastic. You've just made your opponent make a bad decision, or maybe they made a right decision, but you've put some extra... Um, strain on their decision making process and this is a strategy heavy game this is a decision heavy game that's going to cascade into more bad decisions further down the line don't sleep I can say don't sleep a lot but the, the decoy containers are actually really cool and they're really cheap great solutions to difficult situations on top of that we've got the mine container which I haven't talked about at all what you do with this container is you pick a location on the map you launch the container towards it when it gets to that position it deploys two mines to that location this is a really good way for you to set up minefields from the safety of the backfield or the side field um, that your opponent maybe doesn't even realize are there. They have a really fast cruise speed. They move at 175 meters per second. They've got a 12,000 meter range. Um, but be aware that once they have reached their location, you still need to wait 90 seconds for the mines to arm. But it's a way to put minefields in locations where your opponent doesn't even know you've got ships, especially if you launch them earlier on in the game at angles where your opponent's not going to see them coming. 
very cool mind game thing. It's going to really throw people off if mines come at them from locations and angles they're just not expecting because they're going to think you had a ship there. They're going to be like, how did that get there? And it's going to throw them off. Finally, we've got the CM4R rocket container. This is a submunition rocket container. It acts like a torpedo. It'll fly towards your enemy using a radar seeker to come towards them. It's going to be very hard for your opponent to work out what this is unless they've got intelligence systems on their ship to determine what's coming in at them. When it gets within range of your enemy, it will deploy four R2 Piranha rockets and that will then sprint finish to hit your enemy. Those rockets have a cruising speed of 300 feet or 350 meters per second and they will hot launch. Um, this can be a really nasty surprise when mixed in with other missile barrages or just a good finisher for a ship that's limping a little bit, hitting it from the side and just taking it out with four rockets that get sort of hand delivered to the enemy. So again, there's some really cool options in here apart from just using the missile designer to design your own container rock container missiles. You've also got all of these e-war and mind game options, which I really, really like to see in the faction. Since we're speaking about rockets, the RL-18 and the RL-36 rocket launchers are very, very powerful ambush weapons. Every ship in the OSP fleet can mount an RL-18. Here it is on a uh, shuttle. The rockets that this fires are the same ones that come out of the container. They do 350 meter per second cruise speed, range of 7,000 meters, armor pad of 70 centimeters, 850 HP component damage. You do not want to be in a situation where you are cruising around with your axe verge, you're dueling with a bulk freighter, and then out of nowhere, a shuttle shows up behind you and unloads 18 of these missiles into the engines of your ship. This will cripple you. As an Alliance Shelter player, think and be very aware of small ships moving around the periphery of where you're fighting. Consider or assume that every single one of these is basically a technical with a rocket launcher on it, and they are going to come for you. Um, the, the risk and return on a ship like this is very high. This is a very expensive shuttle. It's 200 points, and it has the capability of almost wiping out something up to the length of a Vauxhall with one barrage. If you're an OSP player and you're using these, the temptation is to get to real knife fighting range and just launch these in point blank range, especially if your enemy is, is distracted. I would recommend not getting closer than a thousand meters. If you're under a thousand meters with these rocket launchers, I find that it struggles a little bit to acquire the target and you find the missiles very slowly. From a thousand meters out, it'll launch these at a hugely fast barrage and it, it is very hard for PD to deal with if they're already dealing with something else at the same time. Um, so just be aware of the RL-18 rocket launcher and the RL-36 for both factions. Um, if you have the points left over, it really isn't that many points to mount one on a ship. The launcher itself is five points and each missile is three points, I think. Hang on. Um, each one is three points, so it's not a massive points investment. Obviously, they're one shot. You can't reload them. But if you've got a Corvette left at the end of the game, it's got a rocket launcher on it. It can either take out a reins very quickly with them in the early game. It can contest a point with them. Or later on in the game, when things are damaged, it can sneak up and actually backstab somebody and really scare them out. So that's a really important one to, to be aware of. Now, I mentioned E-War for the OSP earlier on. I want to give you a very quick overview of some of their sensors. They have the R400 Bloodhound Long Range Tracking Radar. This is a very, very powerful 14 kilometer range radar that gives you very good tracks that don't have a lot of positional error on them. Cannot give you a lock, but if you are in a situation in a furball, there's jamming everywhere, and you have on the edge of the battle space a tugboat that can mount this, 14 kilometers away, giving you good track information. You can keep firing on target and you you can deal with a lot of situations. Now, bear in mind, this radar has a very, very limited window. It's it's not a like a wide range radar. I think of it as a very long range um, pinpoint, but it's, it's unparalleled in what it can detect. 40 points is a lot. It needs 3000 kilowatts worth of power, but there's a lot you can do with it. It's very, very cool. You always got the RF44 pinpoint radar. I put it on a lot of ships. It's your tracking radar. It gives you a lock. Um, this radar here, the Bloodhound, doesn't sweep. You have to manually target something with it. You have to right-click, go into your E-War window and select the radar to get it to work. It doesn't automatically give you tracks. That's going to catch a lot of people out. You have to manually activate this Bloodhound radar, but it is very good. There's also the R550 early warning radar. This is a wider ranged radar um, in terms of the, the area that it covers. Um, it gives you very bad tracks. It does not lock. But what it does do is give you a wide picture of the battle space. Again, you can have a ship on the outskirts of the battle, just looking in, giving you information from a new angle, supplying tracks via radio. And this is their version of E-War. It's like passive long range detection rather than um, focused, powerful radars burning through things. It's, it's, it's about building a picture from lots of different angles rather than just blasting through what your enemy have and acquiring them no matter what they're throwing at you. 
Um, so be aware of the Bloodhound and the early warning radar because you do need to manually tell them to track, um, to sweep, sorry. Or it's, I'm getting my, my, my definitions wrong because these can't sweep, but you have to manually tell them to do their work. They won't do it automatically. Um, you also have access to the Lighthouse Illuminator. This is your um, Seeker Missile, um, your semi-active Seeker Missile Illuminator. You've got the Bellbird Jammer, which is an equivalent of the um, the Blanket. You've got the Lyrebird Jammer, which is an omnidirectional radar jammer. Put this on something like an Acello and just generate a jamming field that should disrupt radar jammer missiles as they come into range. And there's also the Blackjack Laser Jammer, which I think is the only electro-optical jammer in the game right now so in a situation where your enemy is specifically launching radar seekers with a backup eo detector and you have both the um the j360 and the l50 on your ship this will actually completely stop those missiles but that's a very 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 narrow use case the lyrebird is probably quite useful just in a general case but it is 100 points and it does require um, a 3 by one by 3 slot to put it into so I want to give you a couple of notes on shipbuilding for the faction, especially bulk freighters, which I think are going to be, well, they're going to be popular. Um, there are basically two different types of bulk freighter the random generator will give you. One type is very compact and bulky, like this one, and the other type is a long, thin ship like this. There's advantages to both types of ships. Now, I do not um, advocate for ship scumming. But I think it's okay to generate a couple of, of ships and pick the one that you like the layout of the most because there's different reasons to take them. The long thin ship here is fantastic for long range combat for the sole reason that it has a very narrow profile when it's broadsiding which will make it harder for your opponent to hit. The downside to this ship is the advantage of this ship which is because it's so compact, your damage control teams will be able to get around the ship very, very quickly, whereas on a long, thin ship like this, it's gonna take a damage control team a long time to get around the ship. They have a movement speed, rapid teams move faster than standard teams, to get repairs done. It's also gonna be harder to hide a long, thin ship behind an asteroid than it is to hide a short, stubby ship behind an asteroid. So these are just things to bear in mind when you're building a ship that are important to think about. When building a bulk freighter, the main temptation or main build for them is going to look something like this. Highly recommend only putting your cannons on one side of the ship. Whilst the temptation and the mental image of having a bulk freighter with casement weapons on both sides, flying into the middle of an enemy fleet, sea whiz shooting in every direction, casement weapons on both sides engaging other different targets, the fact of the matter is these ships do not have the armor to engage like that. You're going to end up in a situation where you're playing cat and mouse, you're hiding behind asteroids, you're popping out and firing. Think about the fact that these guns take a very long time to reload. Yeah, I currently, these currently have a 50 second reload time on my ship and I'll talk about how I've done that and why I've done that and that's a very fast reload for this type of ship. So that's a, a better idea is do what I've done, set up one side for broadside and then use the other side of the ship for utility. I've got, as I mentioned before, container stack launchers here with various tools in here. You can also mount missile launchers for things like either seekers or um, missiles to help you deal with incoming missiles. And this will just give you more points to play with and still keep that devastating broadside, which is why you took the ship in the first place. Um, when you're building the ships, consider um, aiming for, at a minimum, three ammunition elevators, or four if you can fit them. Um, four is the sweet spot before diminishing returns come into play. Um, as you can see, with four ammunition elevators, I have a, a reload time on these guns of 47.8 seconds. If I remove the elevators, that goes down to a 90 second reload time, which is gonna be um, just lethal for you in this situation. If you're using 450 millimeter cannons, which is what I've got here, I would recommend trying to fit a two gun plotting centers to deal with the spread if you can. Um, and if you're doing 250 millimeter fire, I would recommend going for at least one gun plotting center if you can. A really important gameplay element with broadside ships using case with weapons like this is making sure that your guns are all firing together so that you're exposing yourself to danger for the limited amount of time possible rather than having the guns sort of all firing at different times and having to wait for them to all empty their auto loaders before you move back into safety. The most important way to deal with this is to use the weapon controls um, ability down here and setting your ships to hold fire. What I can then do is give an attack command with my guns and you'll see they all switch to blue. That means the guns are bearing to target. At this point, they do not have a shot at their target. You'll see now that they're flashing green. This means that they now are weapons holding with a shot on your enemy. 
You can do this while you're behind an asteroid, wait for your guns to go green and then move out from behind the asteroid. And once your guns are clear, switch from hold to tight and your guns will all fire together in unison. I'll just give another move order. They'll fire together in unison, meaning that your time that you are exposed is as low as possible. What you can then do is as soon as they have finished firing or as they're getting close to the end of the barrage, because you know that you've got eight shots in the autoloader for each cannon, you can then begin to move them back into cover. And what you do then is just switch your weapon controls from tight back to hold while they do the reload. You can see here that these are all going to enter reload at about the same time. That's them all reloading now. I'll switch back to hold. At this point, I would, you know, give my move order to move back into cover, etc. Possibly give a hold or a heading order as well towards my enemy, just to make sure the ship doesn't turn around. And at this point, I just wait for the reload to go through, which we know from previously in this video is about 50 seconds. So you don't want to be sitting exposed to fire while you're doing this reload. Managing where your freighters are and moving them from cover to cover between shots is going to be a really, really big deal. Speaking of controls for weapon controls, you also now have under PD turret, the option to switch to dedicated as an option. What this will do is it'll mean that if your ship is equipped with um, guns that can join your PD network, for instance, my cargo feeders here, um, if I jump over to one of them, um, these have 100 millimeter guns that come armed with um, grape shot by default. If I don't want these guns to commit to PD, I can switch the turret to Deddy, and that means that they will not automatically fire on incoming PD. This is important if you've got something like 250 millimeter cannons, which can join a PD network, and you want to keep them loaded and ready to, to fire for when you actually have the enemy in front of you. Um, if they're shooting at, at incoming missiles, you're gonna have to wait for them to reload before they can fire again. So the, the Deddy option here will just keep them held fire until you give a fire order. But probably the most important one is definitely using hold fire to wait for all of your casement weapons to be loaded and then going weapons free with them so they're firing together, reducing the amount of time that you are exposed to enemy fire so that your crew or your ship are as safe as possible. That's pretty much everything that I wanted to go through in the video. My main picture here was just to go over some stuff I've noticed, stuff I've picked up while I've been building ships, put you in as good a situation as you can get when you get your hands on the update because it is overwhelming. There is a lot to learn here, but it's really, really cool. And I cannot wait to play some games with everybody, get online with everybody and, and have this faction available for everybody. Um, I hope to see you soon. Until then, have fun in the black. Thanks for watching. Ciao.